Ladies and gentlemen, friends, welcome to um, LSE, to this first um, British Government at LSE public lecture of the season. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you. My name is Paul Kelly. I'm the Pro-Director for Teaching at the, the school, former Head of the Government Department um, and part of the British Government at LSE Initiative. We're delighted tonight to launch this season of lectures, activities and events with um, one of the <coughs> best commentators on contemporary British politics and contemporary British history and the, the distinction, if there is one, between those two things I think will be one of the things that, that Peter is going to talk about tonight. For those of you who are interested in such things, I should draw your attention to the hashtag for the event, which is um, hash LSE frenzy. Our speaker, Professor Lord Hennessy, Peter Hennessy, will be known to many of you. Peter is currently um, Professor of Atlee Professor of Contemporary British History at Queen Mary University of London, somewhere in the East, we've heard of. And I did print off um, his bio from Queen Mary University to tell you a little bit about him. It turns out much of it is lies. Peter informs me that there are Inaccurate. things. Well, I, I like to think that uh, there's not a huge difference between some of those things. The important thing for our purposes is that... Uh, Peter is an honorary fellow of LSE and a, a long-standing friend and associate of, of the London School of Economics, having come here in 1969. He's been a journalist, worked for <coughs> The Times, Financial Times, Radio 4, a prominent broadcaster in the field. For some time now, he's been um, an academic, but also a very engaged academic. Um, commenting on, providing advice to whoever needs it on aspects of British government and constitutional government in particular. He's the author of numerous books. I won't list them. The list is quite long, and, and that bit of the bio is, um, is, is accurate. So, I, 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 But he's the author of books such as Cabinet, Cabinet in 1986 and, and, and various other important contributions to um, the, the sub-discipline of of contemporary history. Tonight he's going to be introducing um, the work that, that is his new book and the title of tonight's presentation is Distilling the Frenzy and my understanding is we're going to get um, alongside some of his erudition we're going to get some sense of, of the, the issue about writing contemporary history and how contemporary history is not simply just engaged political journalism. You know, how do you do the history of the near present? So, without further waffle from me, can I welcome, on behalf of British Government at LSE, our speaker tonight, Professor Peter Hennessy. Thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. It's lovely to be back. When I first came here, there really was a frenzy in this very room. Sir William Armstrong, then head of the Home Civil Service, was doing the LSE oration. And the left decided he shouldn't do. And there was a real tussle on this. So maybe some of you veterans might be here from that. I thought I was hallucinating. I was a hearty in those days. I played squash in the morning and consumed several pints of Stella Artois in the White Horse. And I merged into this melee. Quite extraordinary. But anyway, enough of that autobiography. It's a great pleasure to be here. When I was pre preparing this book on writing the history of one's own times, I gradually realised that it was the closest I was going to get to writing an autobiography. And I'm relieved in many ways I'm not going to write an autobiography, but there was one regret, because I had the title ready, and it was this, I've never been one for gossip but, <laughs> but that will be available for somebody else to use now. So can I start with the title of the book I have written, Distilling the Frenzy? Some of you will instantly have recognised it, I'm sure. It comes from a favourite passage of mine towards the end of John Maynard Keynes' 1936 classic, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money, in which he wrote, 
madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years ago. More on that in a moment. First, a few thoughts on the impulses that did turn me towards the historian's trade and to what now amounts to quite a bit of academic scribbling, though I have to say, and it's a relief, I don't think uh, any madmen or mad women in authority have taken the slightest bit of notice of what I've written. But the first and indispensable impulse is one I think I share with all scholars, which is what Albert Einstein called a holy curiosity. It was his last interview in 1955 to Life magazine, and he said, never lose a holy curiosity. And I think that should be the teacher's motto. And in human beings, this takes a vast variety of forms, as does the power of imagination with which it's twinned. My imagination, such as it is, is heavily historical, and I've known it was in terms of my conscious memory since at least the late 1950s. But I suspect that I can't know that the hippocampus, the memory sector of my brain, is the most developed, though inevitably for a post-war baby boy born in 1947. It's a bit of fraying now. And I always had a certain sympathy when he talked about history with that extraordinary scholar-politician Enoch Powell, with whom I got on remarkably well, even though we disagreed about a large number of quite serious things. And Enoch had the habit of coming to audiences like this and talking about history. And he did it in much the same form of words each time. And this is him talking to an audience of undergraduates at Trinity College, Dublin, in 1964. And it'll be the first and last Enoch impression I inflict upon you this <laughs> evening, because it's quite a strain on the vocal cords as well as on you. And what Enoch said was, the life of nations, no less than that of men, is lived largely in the imagination. And he had this extraordinary air raid siren voice. He was a very odd chap, Enoch. He um, used to come in to do Radio 4 discussions with me in the 80s with... Dennis Healy and Roy Jenkins and Tony Benn and others on subjects such as cabinet government. And I'd always say to him, Enoch, before we start, would you like a pee? And he said, no, no, I never have a pee before a broadcast. A full bladder puts one on one's metal. <laughs> Not a tactic to be recommended, I have to say, generally, but Enoch stuck by it. In that same speech in Dublin, he went on to claim that all history is myth. It is a pattern which men weave out of the materials of the past. The moment a fact enters into history, it becomes mythical because it's been taken and fitted into its place in a set of ordered relationships, which is the creation of a human mind and not otherwise present in nature. It's very hard to avoid Enoch's strictures on this, though, I think, because once the historical imagination starts to run like dopamine through the little grey cells, the desire to tell an intriguing story takes over and makes the pace. Now, the founding father of this school in our dear country was the great T.B. Macaulay in the 19th century. And have a listen to another great Victorian imagination, Walter Badgett, writing an obituary of Macaulay in The Economist, which Badgett edited in December 1859. Macaulay, Badgett declared, was a, was a politician for great occasions when the magnifying character, both of his intellect, isn't that a nice phrase, the magnifying character, both of his intellect and his imagination could be brought into play with effect. Badgett went on. His reason analysed and digested those vast and shapeless masses. His imagination collected and coloured them. Out of darkness and dullness and confusion, he formed a multitude of ingenious and vivid pictures. He had in the highest degree that noble faculty whereby man is enabled to live in the past and in the future, in the distant and the unreal. Marvellous stuff. But back now to Enoch. He knew as much as any politician I've known about the power of historical imagination. Indeed, it carried him away in his most notorious speech on immigration in Birmingham in April 1868. 1968, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Enoch did live in several centuries, but indeed it was 1968. But the key to him, I think, and this goes through several centuries, that was a very nice prompt, thank you, because it fits, was an address he gave to the Royal Society of St. George, in April 8, 1964. And what he said was, backward travels our gaze, beyond the grenadiers and the philosophers of the 18th century, beyond the pike men and the preachers of the 17th, back through the brash, adventurous days of the Tudors. And there at last we find them, in many a village church beneath the tall tracery of a perpendicular east window and the coffered ceiling of the chantry chapel. From brass and stone, from line and effigy, their eyes look out at us and we gaze into them as if we would win some answer from their inscrutable silence. 
Tell us what it is that binds us together. Show us the clue that leads through a thousand years. Whisper to us the secret of this charmed life of England, that we in our time may know how to hold it fast. Don't make them like that anymore. Quite extraordinary. But in contrast to Enoch, the distillation of my frenzy is deeply prosaic and covers but a tiny patch of our past in terms of its concentration. Britain post VE Day, Britain since May 1945. It spans the generation that stood firm in the Second World War, finally prevailed with its allies, and then bred me and my generation. And mine is not a thing of line and effigy, of 800-year-old village churches, much as I love them too. Mine is an early welfare state Britain, an age of relative political consensus, possessing a strong sense of a stoical, admirable, recently shared past of great and sustained collective effort. Buckle to this was a post-war austerity, an absence of conspicuous consumption out of which, right across the spectrum, people hoped would come a juster, healthier, better educated and more socially harmonious country when easier times return. Now that was the aspiration. And that, I have to confess, ladies and gentlemen, is still my sustaining myth, my gold standard, which I profoundly hope that period will not prove to be the high water mark of institutionalized decency in British history, though I fear it might. But there will, in the next 20 minutes or so, no doubt, be a whole extra sheaf of my sustaining myths this evening, running through what I say. And I think I'm especially prone, I suspect most of us are, to that in those passages of personal history where Seamus Heaney put it, hope and history rhyme. For example, going back to 1953 when I was six, that extraordinary summer, which was a bit like the one we just lived through, the glorious Olympic summer, in a different way. It's coronation, the night before, and British and Commonwealth Expedition had been the first team to reach the top of Everest. It was the era, and I read the Eagle comic, which men of a certain age probably read as well. It had cutouts of the New Art Royal and the design for Gatwick Airport, which is going to be the ultimate airport of the future. And the new Calder Hall, the first civil nuclear power station, which we were also way ahead on. And in Finchley up the road, I used to listen out for the sound of a jet engine in case it was a comet coming down from Hatfield. It was a strange upbringing because without being able to articulate it, one had a sense, even as a little boy, that one belonged to a success story nation that could somehow handle the 800-year-old tradition that was manifest in the coronation and do the marvellous modern things that were happening all around. And um, I think that stays with you. It's a generational thing. But it certainly stayed with me. But yet the pitfalls of writing the history of one's own country, very largely within the compass of one's own memory and experience of it, and there are, I'll come back to some of those in a minute, are trumped by the perpetual fascination of this curiosity-filled pursuit undertaken, one can only hope, in the spirit of Spinoza, who declared in 1677 that I've striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, nor to hate them, but to understand them. There's a temptation which my students share with me when we're reading the Cabinet and Cabinet Committee minutes way back, is to heckle them. Come on, surely even then you should have realised this. What hubris. How on earth could you have ignored the following? And it's tremendously dangerous to do that, because that involves what Edward Thompson famously called the enormous condescension of posterity, which is fatal. And it applies as much to high policy as to what Jack Plum called, in an amazingly autobiographical passage in his 18th century Pelican, the deadly intoxication of well-expressed malice. <laughs> Gossip. I'll come back to that in a minute, because it's the one book I won't now write, which I, looking back, wish I'd set about doing when I was in my late 20s and first a journalist, which is the a history of the impact of gossip, rumour and scuttlebutt on high policy and government. It is remarkable how influential it is every day uh, when everybody's down at Westminster and in Whitehall. And it's very hard to recapture it, because private eye only gives you a certain bit of it. The diaries of other people give you a bit of it. And if it's to be written properly, I think I should have started writing a notebook of it all when in my mid to late 20s I first started reporting British politics. But it's a huge gap in the literature. And any of you younger students can think of a way of doing it. Do it, because it's a huge, huge thing that we need. And just think of the jokes and the gossip and the scuttlebutt and the intoxication of the well-expressed malice. It's the lubricant of society and of politics. Too late for me now. 
Um, Michel de Montaigne, sitting in his tower in the Dordogne, a very long time ago, 1580 to be precise, in his essay of books, knew this. He talked about the power of rumour in the shaping of history. This, he declared, is the material of history, naked and unformed. Each man can make a profit of it to his understanding, which was remarkably prescient. But it's not just professional historians to, all, to whom all this applies, for we live our own history, even if most of us never write it or record it. We are all more than human footnotes to our own times. We're all contemporary historians. And in my more frivolous moments, particularly when we have to fill in all that ludicrous stuff on the research exercise framework about impact and construct our Potemkin villages at the behest of the Higher Education Funding Council for England, Oh, what harm they've done to our dear country. Anyway, in my more frivolous moments, I think the definition of contemporary history is gossip with footnotes. <coughs> but one dare put that down in these, these reports that one has to send in at regular intervals. The other motivation is, was caught by the great economist Paul Samuelson. And he said, never underestimate the vital importance of finding early in life the work that for you is play. And I've been very fortunate in that because I had 20 years as a journalist before I went straight, joined the university world, and I've been 20 years in the university, which I've loved every minute of, and recently I've gone into the House of Lords as a crossbench peer, which is a pure delight, not least because of every day the flow of weapons-grade gossip, <laughs> particularly from the Anglican bishops. <laughs> Though it's been very hard to get anything out of them about the, the latest business, but give it time. Now, the economist with whom I began, the incomparable Maynard Keynes, singled out two particular branches of learning in that quotation from which the title of my new book is drawn. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, the great polymath of King's Cambridge declared, both when they're right and when they're wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Then comes the bit about madmen in authority, which I've quoted already. I like to think that Maynard Keynes, were he writing today, might have put historians in with his economists and political philosophers. For several members of our recent political class like to talk in their toe-curling postmodern fashion about the need to create a convincing narrative, that dreadful word, with which to beguile and manipulate the electorate. Parties compete not just for votes, but there for their interpretation of the recent past. As if their version of history could bring a kind of benediction to what the great Victor Rothschild called the promises and panaceas that gleam like false teeth in the party manifestos. I, I never understood what modernism was, let alone postmodernism, and this word narrative I find great problems with. Have you noticed, too, a vision is required of everybody? When I was a young Catholic boy before Vatican II, that was confined to mystics. <laughs> but now even management consultants are required to have vision. So I think it's a terrible problem. It's all bollocks on stilts, every version I've ever come across. So I, you know, I'm going to spare you a vision tonight, which will, I hope, be a relief to everybody concerned. Anyway, contemporary history, well-researched and written for what the American political scientist, Gabriel Armand, called the attentive public, should be the antidote to the virus of crude political capture. That we contemporaries, however, have our own deformation professionnelle, unless we're very careful. For example, there always lurks the danger of an agreed view amongst a few authors, a kind of informal authorised version, particularly those of us who are lucky enough to get the commercial publishers to take us up, and those that are good at selling books. And there's usually between six and ten on a particular chunk of history who do this, and between them, they can, they can without meaning to, produce a near-authorised version. You have choreographed debates within that, like whether there was a, what, a genuine political consensus across the board, or 80% of the board, or whatever, in the post-war years or not. But we need to sustain these debates. In fact, it would be fatal if they ever were resolved, because you wouldn't be able to set any exam questions. So there's a sort of artificial element of fanning the flames of these ancient debates. Uh, whether we have cabinet government or prime ministerial government, I mean, that fluctuates, but that's another old favourite. And it's all wonderfully choreographed, you see. And that's a deformation professionnel as well, I think. But before digging further into the caveats and the concerns, how do I see those of us who make our living by taking our students and our readers back into the more recent layers of the compost that made them and their country what they are? We are, I think, 
the scholarly equivalent of those stay-behind groups that the British Secret Intelligence Service and the American CIA had ready in case the Red Army really did move westward to the Channel ports without the mutual annihilation of nuclear war and succeeded in occupying great swathes of Western Europe with Warsaw Pact and Soviet forces. And this notion of that we're stay-behinders came to me when I was reading a wonderful social history of Britain, came out about three years ago, by my friend and mentor, Paul Addison, No Turning Back, when he lingered on the significance of placing a photograph amidst its pages of himself as a 14-year-old member of Lower Five Modern at King Edward VI School in Lichfield in May 1957. Would I, Paul Addison asked, if I could put the clock back to Britain as it was in 1957? Hardly. The gains we've made since then outweigh the losses. I have to admit, however, that the passage of time has left me with a sense of disorientation I can never quite suppress. At some barely conscious level of my imagination, the England of which I was a part in the late 1950s is forever the norm, and almost everything that's happened since is a puzzling deviation. Paul went on, much as I like to think of myself as fully adult, I know that somewhere at the back of my mind lurks a schoolboy forever putting up his hand to ask why smoking is banned in the cinema, or why passengers on the railway are referred to as customers, or why so many couples live together without getting married. I know exactly how he feels. The difference between Paul and me is no more than four or five years, 200 or so miles, and the names of our grammar schools. For Addison Reed King Edward VI, Litchfield, 1957, the Hennessy Reed Marling School, Stroud, 1961. And I suspect we contemporary historians all have an equivalent, and it's a useful spot from which to peer back and forward, to sniff the air. And in those years, you see, you still coal smoke on the air everywhere, sulfur. And the Clean Air Acts hadn't worked their way through. Steam locomotives churning it out. Even the sound of pericomo takes me back. It's a bit nerdy thing. Well, the very sad thing to admit, really, isn't it? But never mind. And Pacamax. I mean, we won't know what they are. So the terrible grey plastic max that we all wore. Even the Queen, if you look in Philip Ziegler's very interesting official history, official biography of Harold Wilson, you see a photograph which Philip said Harold carried in his wallet next to his heart to the end of his days, because he loved the Queen, and it's the, the September visit to Balmoral, which Prime Ministers traditionally take, and the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh put them in Land Rovers and take them up somewhere on the edge of the Grampians, usually in pouring rain, and the Duke cooks sausages and so on. It's, it's part of the constitution of the United Kingdom. <laughs> and um, there's Harold with his tweed jacket and his pipe like this, and there's the Queen in this Pacamac lamp, you see. So even the Queen wore Pacamacs, and I go straight back to that period when I see one. I don't see them as often as I used to. And it was an extraordinary era, really. I mean, I can, this, you will not believe this, but I know we had the sort of limited life in the 50s and 60s, but the myth of the 60s will come back to, no doubt. But I can remember the excitement when my father's A35, Austin A35, crossed on the way to see my sister in Northampton. We were coming from the Cotswolds where we lived then. Crossed the M1. We'd stop so I could look at the M1, which was the height of modernity and excitement. I mean, can you imagine anybody stopping to look at the M5 or the M1 now? But we did. Cliff Richard was the highest form British pop music had ever taken. You know, if we had gone under 50 years ago in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was perfectly possible, the highest flowering of British pop music would have been Sodding Cliff, because <laughs> the Beatles had only had one hit, Reach Number 8, Love Me Do. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? I mean, there are many reasons for being thankful that we didn't have World War III in the first week of November 1962, but that, for me, is quite high up the list. So natural stay-behinders, we contemporary historians are. We're also avid catcher-uppers talking of the Cold War, purveyors of what one might call now-it-can-be-told history, especially once the formerly immensely classified files have been released at the National Archives that were held back beyond 30 years. The great William Waldegrave, scholar-politician, as Minister for Open Government in John Major's cabinet, um, facilitated this. And in, the, in five years, they've stopped counting now, 96,000 files were re-reviewed <clears throat> and released at Kew. Some of them an immense sensitivity on the intelligence and the nuclear fronts in particular. And a whole new series of PhDs and a whole new genre of books has been made possible by them. And so the catch-up notion is part of this brigaded with the stay-behind impulse. And that is still continuing. 
And the test for me, anyway, when I write a book for general consumption, is what Melvin Bragg called generational kinship. I mean, one tries to write for everybody, but the test for me is whether my own generation will say, ah, that's just how I remember it. And then, heavens above, I didn't know that. How on earth did they keep that secret for so long? So stay behind and catch up are a great help in preventing the past, actually, from being displayed with the enormous condescension of posterity. Now, <clears throat> as well as the concepts and the beliefs that made the climate of consciousness in the days that one's writing about in the past, we need to stretch the weather metaphor still further and to apply the best biographical techniques to those individuals who, in Churchill's famous description of Joseph Chamberlain, made the political weather. And not just the big political weather makers who tend to do all right by history. I mean, even if Boris doesn't become prime minister, he'll have even more biographies. I, a question time, perhaps we could raise Boris, because I ha I'm not sure that if he was called Eric and had a normal head of hair, whether we'd be in the slightest bit interested in him. We probably would, but I don't know. I'm quite entirely convinced by that. But the people we miss out are the technologists and the scientists, and in some cases the geologists in our story of the past. For example, I did know, but I've forgotten the name of the BP geologist engineer who first realised there was an enormous lot of oil in the Fortis field in the North Sea. People like that, they don't get their place in the sun. We need, for example, and the Science Museum is about to put it right, a really good history of civil nuclear power in the UK, particularly as we're trying to get back into it, but there isn't one. I mean, people have done good bits of it, but there's not a synthesis one for the general reader. Now, much of the requirement that we contemporaries share with our brother and sister historians who go back deep into the past, uh, obviously we do, but there are certain advantages we have. We can talk to people, the survivors. And of course, this has a double edge to it, because for teaching purposes, there was a wonderful remark which summed up the Labour government's attitude to the beginnings of the EU, the coal and steel community plan in May 1950, when Jean Monnet turned up out of the blue in the Hyde Park Hotel, which he, he seemed to favour, and summoned the senior Whitehall figures to unveil the plan for them to explain to ministers for a coal and steel community, out of which everything else flowed. And um, Roger Sherfield, Roger Makins, who was a friend of mine, was one of the two senior officials. The other was Edwin Plowden. And according to the memoirs of Etienne Hirsch, who was one of the French economists with Monet, after half an hour, Roger said, we're not ready and you won't succeed, good morning, which summed up the British attitude. And this is a great aid to teaching. And just before my book on that period was going to be published, I met Roger on a bus in Whitehall. And he said, what are you writing now? I said, well, you're a star as always. You're a wonderful one-liner dismissing the coal and steel plan. A wonderful one-liner. So I relayed it to him just as I have to you. He said, I never said that. <laughs> He said, well, Etienne, I said, well, Etienne Hirsch says you did. He said, he's dead, and I'm alive. In fact, they're all dead apart from me. <laughs> so it snatched away. So I put it in the book with a footnote. Lord Sherfield denies ever saying it. It was so irritating. <laughs> so irritating. But never mind. It's a small price to pay for being able to talk to survivors. But to return to the big picture, the current utility of history for all of us, and in particular those in authority over us. And... There's a wonderful course, which I think we need to replicate here, if we can, that Dick Newstadt and Ernie May used to run at Harvard called Thinking in Time, for Pentagon, State Department, advisors to senators and so on. And um, this gave them all the stuff in the past. And John Lewis Gaddis runs a wonderful course on strategy at Yale, which is very similar. Um, uh, he, he, he was at the Cheltenham Festival with me last weekend, and he put it very well. He said, you can't... Horizon scanning can't tell you how things are going to be, but you're like an athletics coach. If you give them the best horizon scanning in the past and the best classic strategic works in the past, you've got them at least into a state of fitness where they might be slightly better prepared for the unforeseen. And that's a great course, I think, and we could do with all that here. For some people in authority, thinking like this, thinking in time, as Newstat and May put it, comes naturally. Henry Kissinger would be an American example. Harold Macmillan would be a British. Of course, there are cynics who would say, and a fat lot of good it did them. But there we are. Um, my friend Robin Butler's in the audience, and he gave me permission to quote him, at least I hope you did, Robin, from that Royal College of Defence Studies seminar we did over a year ago on government and strategy for the military. And I was Robin's discussant. And Robin said... 
um, as the inquiry into WMD in Iraq, that the people who took the Iraq decisions were ignorant of history and, and didn't even want to be told about it. And then Robin went on very kindly to say every department should have a chief historical advisor who he or she wouldn't know everything, but they'd know who to turn to to get a bit of context. And that's an interesting thought. It matters particularly in a country that still, in Douglas Hurd's wonderful phrase, wants to punch heavier than its weight in the world. Now, there are, I'm one of those, because of my background and my age probably, that, that's as bad as anybody at that, really. I'm not a wider still and wider man. I don't overdo it, but I still think that we can do quite good things in the world if we're careful. But as William Watergrave said about his great mentor, Douglas Hurd, the trouble with punching above your weight in the world is you're constantly in danger of being knocked out, which I think is a good antidote to it. In fact, looking back over the sweep of post-war history, aspirational disarmament has been extremely hard for us, extremely hard, and it still is. And the instinct to intervene, uh, as Douglas Hurd put it again, is particularly difficult to um, handle in some cases. Now, um, can I finish with a bit of semi-confessional thoughts? It's not done in the historian's trade to emote. And indeed, being an Englishman brought up in the 50s, I was trained not to emote, but this is the nearest I'm going to get to it. And I thought as I wasn't going to write an autobiography, I'd end the book that I'd done for my friend Sean McGee, who's sitting at the back, my publisher, with a bit of this. So I shall finish with this, and then we can have a discussion. To have lived and breathed in these islands, to have absorbed the ways we pursue our scholarship, arrange our politics, carry out our administration of both government and justice, exchange our gossip, deploy our humour, for all their imperfections and irritations, comes very close, especially when the joys of family are mixed into winning the pools in life, or the lottery in life, as we now say. That's why it's impossible for me, I go on, to evaporate myself off from my country, as an old friend of mine in the secret world who can't do it either likes to put it. It's a persistent compulsion. This, in the end, is why writing the history of one's own country in one's own times is such a pleasurable and self-energizing, if ultimately unrealizable, pursuit in the sense of completeness. Thank you very much for having me with you this evening. Thank you. Okay, we have, we have plenty of time for questions, responses to Peter's talk. Um, we have roving microphones, so if you could indicate, um, I'll ask someone to bring a microphone to you. Please wait until the microphone comes. We are recording this, so it's important that you speak into the microphone. Um, perhaps you could introduce yourself and ask questions rather than give speeches if you wish. Start with George. George Jones, LSE. Is there a Peter Hennessy theory of history? Thank you, George. George is one of my great mentors and friends, so he gave me advance notice of that question, <laughs> and I sent him a, a stab at it. And being my great friend and mentor, he's subbed it, which George is brilliant at. But I'm going to give you my first thought, George, if that's all right. Um, I don't do theories, really, because I belong to the Max Bygrave School of History. I want to tell you a story. You know, Max died the other day. Um, I'm interested in other people's theories, but I can't bring myself to do it. Um, but I've had a go because I always try to do what George asked me to do. So here it is. This is like Blue Peter, George. This is here's one we made earlier, isn't it? Prepared earlier. History serves to partially satisfy the curiosity of the human species about how and why it got to where it is. In pursuit of this, the job of the historian is a bit like that of the subatomic physicist to discern the shape both of the waves and the particles of the past in careful patterns, which strive to the utmost to avoid distortion and oversimplification, while making them comprehensible to a wider reading public, and avoiding, here we go again, what Edward Thompson called the enormous condescension of posterity. I wouldn't have tried to write that down if George hadn't asked me. So, if it irritates you, it's George's fault. Thank you, George. <laughs> When you, uh, on, uh, when you set out to uh, write a history of your own times, do you have any um, examples? Can you think of any other um, historians or politicians who have written a distinguished history of their own times? Oh, I mean, if you yeah. range back, I mean, who were your mentors? Well, the people who are writing in the period I'm writing about now, 
the series as I am, uh, Dominic Sandbrook and David Kinniston, I'm full of admiration for because, and the more the merrier, because they can hear and see things I can't. Um, uh, I'm no good on social and cultural, but going way back, um, well, contemporary history was thought to be dodgy until fairly recently. I mean, famously, the Oxford History School stopped at 1914, I think, when I was an undergraduate. Cambridge became a bit further forward. But it was thought that you couldn't do it because they weren't the primary sources. And also, it was too recent. It was a higher journalism. So contemporary history, uh, Anthony Selden and I s set up the Institute for Contempor Contemporary British History to help try and do something about that. So it's quite recent. Um, Walter Badgett did it, but he did it as editor of The Economist. But he did it to enormous effect because the British Constitution remains a thing of magic and mystery, I'm glad to say. Um, but until Walter wrote it down in The Economist as a series of essays and published it in 1867 as the English Constitution, nobody knew what it was. And that became the surrogate for, an unwritten, for, for a written constitution to a remarkable degree. And every monarch since um, Edward, the heir to Victoria, has been taught by a schoolmaster from coming up from Eton when they were young to take them through Walter Badgett's The English Constitution. So Walter did it, and if you look at Norman St. John Stevens's collected essays, letters, and journalism of Walter Badgett, it's fabulous. It's not written as a contemporary history of high Victorian England, but that's in fact what it is. And he's never been surpassed in many ways. Macaulay did it through writing in the Edinburgh Review about current matters, and also he used past exemplars and periods to reflect on what was happening. But I think Walter Badgett's the founder of it, actually. And as to that documents point, uh, I, used to, I don't get cross with my fellow historians much because we, you know, we're all in it together. But they say they haven't got any primary material. Oh, bloody contraire! If you go to the National Archives, you can't move for documents. And I'd say if you get a new pipe roll you're, every ten years, you're ecstatic. And we get cornucopic releases every every year in the National Archives, and not just in the, in the annual release now of the 30 years, and it's going down to 20 bit by bit, starting next January, two years at a time. So we're deluged, and also freedom of information, though it's a strange phenomenon, that one has helped. But above all, the Walgrave Initiative has helped, enormous swathes of material released. And the trouble now is going to be with the information explosion, is retrieving it, blogosphere and all the rest of it. And also, now Whitehall has gone electronic, I don't think we're going to get the stuff kept that we used to. If, for example, in the paper days, mostly in the 80s, we're still releasing in the 80s, we get 82 in January, 82 and 83. It's the paper days. And you can see how a draft changes uh, through going through several hands. But if you're lucky now, I fear, only the final version is kept. You'll still get Prime Minister scribbles on things. But in terms of the, uh, the bonanza of paper, it's going to get more and more difficult to retrieve. But, um, so, but contemporary British history is a pretty recent thing, and there are still some who think it's the high journalism. I don't mind, actually, because I've been very fortunate. When I was a journalist, uh, people used to say, Peter's all right, but he's no new sense, because he's an academic, really. And then when I went to Queen Mary, they'd say, Peter's all right, really, but no, he's all right at history, but he's a journalist, really. And so you live on this jagged edge between the two, which is the place to be, I think. That's a very self-serving answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just uh, following on one of the points you've raised, then briefly another. Um, <clears throat> do you think the Freedom of Infor Information Act is actually uh, in the interests of future contemporary historians? And I raise that point because, for example, of ministers now using their private uh, private emails, private mobiles. I mean, Mrs. Uh, Sarah Vincent, uh, Mrs. Michael Gove. Uh, in other words, a lot of this, uh, a lot of their uh, uh, secret discussions are now actually being, basically being hidden from anybody uh, for the future. That's the first point. The second point, are you pushing for a chief historical advisor in each department? I've sat next to at dinner the, the, uh, the uh, historian of the Foreign Office, but she's she, uh, well, well, she uh, was a she at the time. And she a very was, good one. Too. And a very good one, yeah. And how, yes. Uh, but the point is, the actual advisor, and I was speaking just recently to another professor, Lord Asa Briggs, who basically said, 
uh, that if anybody had known anything of the history of Afghanistan, the two Afghan wars, we'd have never gone in there. Indeed, anybody who had studied the India Office papers of the late 19th century would know that they knew far more about the Afghan situation then than we do now. It's a remark attributed to Harold Macmillan, but I've never been able to source it. History teaches you nothing save one thing, never invade Afghanistan. <laughs> On the FOI point, it's very interesting because it's of limited use to historians and PhD students because it only gives you little snippets and you need long runs. Anybody that's done an undergraduate thesis, master's or PhD knows you need long runs and you get little bits. And uh, that's why the Wargrave Initiative was so good because it was a category release in many cases. Areas were opened up and whole runs of documents were released. And also, I didn't realise, we had a great debate in the House of Lords, because Robin spoke in as well, on the on this very point of people of information and archives. And um, the, whether there had been or not a chilling effect of FOI in terms of Whitehall record keeping and candor at meetings. And the people on the inside from Whitehall said there most certainly was. But the Justice Select Committee found that there wasn't, interesting enough. I hadn't realized the magnitude of the problem until, um, and I can mention this because Gus O'Donnell, the Cabinet Secretary, won back. Um, said who was there and what we'd done. There was a meeting in his office on the 16th of February 2010 with outsiders, uh, lawyers and historians, uh, on what the British Constitution was on the Hung Parliament. There were custom and practice and precedent, but it wasn't written down. The feeling was that if we did have a Hung Parliament in today's circumstances, it might be an idea that conventions were written down somewhere and made public in advance. And we met in Gus's office for a sandwich lunch, 90 minutes it took to do it. I mean, there'd been a lot of preparatory work, uh, but we did it in 90 minutes. And Gus opened the meeting, and he's given me permission to say this in the past, with remember, this meeting is FOIable. And I hadn't realized then the degree to which that is going on. And it is a great, I mean, I'm a freedom of information man, but if it means that people can't speak truth under power, which is the only reason for having a career civil service that's not politicized, um, it's very worrying. And I don't know if Robbie wants to comment, but those who have been on the inside say that I think Section 35, I think it is, of the Freedom of Information Act 2000, which is meant to guarantee the confidentiality of those discussions, is not absolute <coughs> by any means. And that's yet to be <coughs> resolved. Um, so I've got mixed feelings about freedom of information. And I probably invested too much hope in it in my Pollyanna years. And when I used to, um, when the time in my youth on the Times, when we used to campaign for it, and now it's here, it's like everything else, you know, it's like being a pool's winner. It's not quite <laughs> what it was meant to be. But the point for scholarly purposes is that we need these runs of documents. But some of the FOI stuff is fascinating, um, and uh, but it is costly and it is time-consuming. And the deal that was struck with Whitehall on it, I don't think has held, to be honest. But I don't, know, Robin, if you want to comment. I'm going to bring him in just a moment. There's yes. There's a second question about the, are you doing anything about the uh, departmental historians? Oh, well, um, I wouldn't want to be one, but I'd be very happy if other people were. Uh, as I wouldn't want to be an official historian, but I'm very glad that other people are, um, to be honest. So, um, well, it would be better if others pushed for it, really, because it sounds wildly self-serving. It sounds like a Keynesian job creation scheme. And I may be a bit of a Keynesian on the site, but that would be a bit blatant, wouldn't it? Well, on that, I ask Lord, Lord Butler, you have... Always <coughs> dropping Robin in it, but he always forgets me. Well, Robin Butler, now, I'd actually put up my hand because I want to ask you a question. But mm. um, I, just on the uh, Freedom of Information Act, actually, I don't think that it is, uh, you know, it has been beneficial, either to history or even more, which worries me more, honest government. Mm. I'm afraid, you know, that uh, fear of uh, exposure will drive a lot underground, perhaps has, but I've got no uh, current experience of it, so I really don't know if I fear it. Now, the question I wanted to ask you was this. Are there, uh, would you dignify uh, political memoirs as contemporary British history, and if there are any that you would dignify with that title, which? Very good question. Well, memoirs are a kind of catharsis. They're part of the psychodrama of it, really, rather than history. 
The ones I like that are flavorful and are written by the people concerned without the help of a ghost are my favorites. I remember Dennis Healy came on when his very good memoirs were published to a Radio 3 discussion with me. And they always over-record five or ten minutes, as you know. And this bit wasn't used, but I'm sure Dennis will forgive me if I tell you. But I said um, Douglas Hurd was also discussing another person who wrote a beautiful memoir, and it is his hand, because he's a wonderful writer. I said, Dennis Healy, let's turn to the problem of the ghost-written memoir. I know yours are genuine, because they're just as you are, and within the space of a single paragraph, they're witty, sophisticated, and vulgar. To which Dennis replied, oh, yes, and what is the French for sod off? Which was, very <laughs> which was not broadcast. One has to be very careful with them, but you can juggle them if you've got more than one. Or, well, it's almost incontinent now compared to the old days, how many you get and how swiftly. Diaries I prefer. Diaries you have to be careful with. Barbara Castle, for example, though, um, was a terrific diarist because she was a Daily Mirror trained shorthand writer. So she'd write down snatches of verbatim, whereas Dick Crossman would dictate them at the weekend. Tony Benn would do them every evening. And... Um, as a young journalist, I used to go and see Tony occasionally, and I checked the accounts of the conversations we'd had, because quite often he'd record them, as you know, the old tape recorder would go on, and they are absolutely accurate. But you have to be very careful, and the danger is that too much of the... If you think the tomorrow morning's national newspapers, the qualities such as we have them, are the first rough draft of history, the diaries and the memoirs are about draft number three or four, and the danger is... And until the archive is opened, they make too much of the historical running. When I was here um, as a postgrad, thank heavens we had the Dalton Diaries, which George will remember, for the Attlee years. But much of the history was heavily attuned by the Dalton Diaries because it was all we had. And the, he published bits in his memoirs, but we had access to the actual thing in the, in the library here. So there is a danger in them. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be without them. But as Clement Attlee famous said of the, famously said of the H-bomb, they need watching, the memoirs. But I understand why people write them. But the trouble is, some of the people, I don't want to be unkind, I won't name any names, I think see them as a, the first instalment of a pension fund. And there's an almost indecent rush to get it out. And I can understand why, too, because the great hatreds in politics, I think it's true to say, are not, across, are not between the parties, they're within. It's always the people in the cabinet in your own party you can't stand. It's like you're living together for too long. It's like colleges and ancient universities. You know, the feuds last decades and people distill in their own bile. And, you know, it's dreadful. And that's the, me the memoirs and the diaries are the equivalent of certain old dons that perhaps we can imagine without being too unkind. So I wouldn't be without them, but they're, they're tricky. They're tricky things. At the front. Oh, oh, hold on just a second. Read the microphone. So, Esme Chandler, I would like to take up your invitation of Boris. Yes. What about Boris? And isn't he awfully similar in many ways to Tony Blair? That's very unkind to both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I really am going to be unkind. Now. Tony Blair and I never hit it off. We very rarely met. But I have problems, being at my age group and background, with politicians that appear to be destiny politicians, who gave the impression, even before the war phase, of getting out of bed in the morning to the sound of the opening bars of Beethoven's Fifth, you know, destiny knocking on the door. Ba 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 ba! I have trouble, trouble with that. Um, I don't know if Boris thinks he's a man of destiny. He's certainly the greatest vaudevillian in British politics for a very long time. And we do need cheering up. Um, if Malcolm Muggeridge said that British people prefer their prime ministers, I've got senior politicians, to be either bishops or bookies. And there may be something in that. Um, Boris is a remarkable man. And, uh, but it is amazing how many people can see things in him that might not be there, if I can put it charitably. But he is a wonderful turn. He's a combination of the classical learning and Woodhouse, which makes him to some quite irresistible. And he's good at helping avoid boredom. And the trouble with politics is that um, too much of it is, is attuned to that. Uh, this isn't about Boris, uh, but I, I have one worry about those leadership debates in the run-up to the last election. Part of me is very glad they took place because they increased the turnout, as far as we can tell, of the 18 to 30 age group who have not been voting much, not compared to the old days. But when you think about it, we're stuck with those now. 
And it means that when parties choose their future leaders, they're going to have quite a high premium placed on how will this person we're going to choose play out in those leadership debates. And to star in those leadership debates, you need the skills of a plausible tart. That's what you need, above all. And that is about this much of the requirement of being Prime Minister. And it means that very good people are not going to have the slightest chance, I think, of being party leaders because they are not plausible tarts, and they wouldn't shine in those circumstances. Not only is my one political hero, it's another row George and I have had for 30 years, Mr. Attlee, inconceivable in today's political terms generally, but just imagine how Clem would have fared on the leadership debates. Quite, perhaps. No, you're quite wrong there. That's about all you'd have got. And of course, it might be deeply attractive if we had somebody who was countercultural, to use a terrible word I don't like, um, who, as Douglas Jay said of Clem, would never use one syllable where none would do. Perhaps a new fashion would be set, but it would be high risk, wouldn't it? And I do worry, I do worry about those, uh, those leadership debates. And I hope to heavens it doesn't get to the American stage where they talk about their wives and sweetie and so on. I mean, uh, that alone would rule me out from being Prime Minister, which is a, there are many other reasons, but that is one I can tell you. Uh, my wife thinking I was a man of destiny and a sweetie would not have been a problem if I was Prime Minister. Further questions? At the front. Well, just on a comparative note, to what's the situation in, um, in, say, France, Germany, and um, Italy? Do you have any idea? Or has there been similar movements towards uh, freedom of information in yes. those countries? Yes, they were ahead of us, um, and certainly the old Commonwealth was, and we took our lessons from Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Although Mel Cap, my friend, who was Robin Butler's equivalent in the Privy Council Office, Cabinet Secretary, and Ottawa, who was the High Commissioner here, and he said it publicly, he said it at Queen Mary many times, I warned Whitehall, don't touch freedom of information, don't touch it, because um, what Mel had in mind, and they were way down the line compared to us, was I think Brian Mulroney was Prime Minister when it happened, and the hacks got the, um, the cost and the hotel living expenses of the Canadian delegation to an OECD meeting in Paris, you see, and that made all the money. Stuff. Well, I mean, he did here, too, later. Uh, but Mel did try to warn Whitehall not to touch it. And Tony Blair, in his memoir, which I find very difficult to read, I forced myself to read certain bits, had that great outburst. I can't remember the exact words. What a fool, what a ninny I was, and to do all this, to, you know, to even contemplate FOI. But the... So um, where was Sir when I needed That's what he said, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And where were you, Robin? <laughs> no, that's unkind. It mainly happened after you'd gone, didn't it? Oh, didn't it? <laughs> but um, I think politics, I'm not a great, great feel for French or German politics, really. I'm interested in them. Um, but I've never tried to write about the bureaucracies in France and Germany in the way that I've had a good crack at um, over the years of writing them here. Um, but. I remember talking to the first head of the Canadian equivalent of MI5, CSIS, Darcy Finn, Ted Finn, who was in the Privy Council office and talked to me on the record for the Times about secrecy. And this is when Mark, Mrs. Thatcher was Prime Minister, and I have great respect for Mrs. Thatcher, but I used to think she would classify Hansard if she thought she could get away with it. She was not a natural opener. And it was quite plain we were some years away from more open government. Though Douglas Heard, as Home Secretary, persuaded her of the need for a slimmer Official Secrets Act. I mean, Douglas was extremely good at that. And I said to Ted Finn, what is it about the Brits, because he knew us very well, that makes us so naturally secretive? And he said, well, it's your formation. You can't help it in many ways, because being geographically located where you are, um, you've always been vulnerable, very vulnerable to threats, external threats. You've always been on the key leave, certainly compared to North America. And so, the necessary military virtues of secrecy and security have spilled over into civil areas where they're not fitting. But I do understand why, said Ted, which was very interesting because he was a good observer on our system. But I suspect it's true that every country that's gone through FOI, those who've had to implement it have come to regret it. But that's the nature of things, isn't it? But I do, do take what Robin and the other cabinet secretaries said seriously in that debate in the House of Lords. You do need one patch where absolute candor can be the norm. 
for all concerned. I mean, it's absolutely vital that. Instead of thinking what will happen if it gets into the hands of the Guardian or anybody else come for that. Yes. It was. That's the, uh, the breakthrough on the decodes of the Russian military intelligence ciphers from New York and Washington in the early Cold War. And um, indeed, it's very important for our Cold War history as well. And not all of it's been worked through. I think there's probably some that may come still. Very rare breakthrough into that cryptography. And that did change the way we saw certain things. Um, but that wasn't freedom of... In well, it was freedom of information in a way, wasn't it, um, in the United States. And I think the British government was very reluctant for it to come out, just as the British government was extremely reluctant for the ultra story to come out. And you can see why from the National Archives. <coughs> because... Um, when a British colony was given independence, they were, to put it directly, given an old Enigma machine repainted with another name and said, this is entirely secure for your diplomatic communication. <laughs> Which um, they got quite cross when the Ultra story came up. And because when an independence thing was done, I think it was Church House where the colonial office was in those days, you could do it quite quickly after a while. There was a room which I've never seen with all the shields of the colonies on. And when one was done, it would be removed, leaving a sort of dusty imprint, which is a great symbol of imperial disposal. <laughs> and there was a memo to the Crown agents for a wig for the new Speaker and a base for the new House of Commons, a memo to Buckingham Palace for a member of the royal family to do the flag-up, flag-down routine in the stadium, and a memo to Cheltenham for a repainted Enigma machine to be sent out to them. You know, talk about perfidious Albion. And I can say this now because it's in the Colonial Office files, um, this stuff. I, I knew about it earlier, but it was, um, it's been declassified now. But there we are. Tony. Tony Travers from the LSE. <coughs> You've spoken this evening and obviously written extensively about the 1950s and the importance to you of the 1950s. And I wonder, looking back now as a, as, as a historian, what you detect to be the difference between the mythic version of the 1950s, the one that so informs many people and their views, even now, certainly by reference, to the mythic version, as compared with the 1950s as they were? Well, there was much more loosening up in society. The 60s didn't happen Tommy Cooper style just like that. Of course it didn't. There was a lot of loosening up, particularly after suits and attitudes and so on. And there were the social legislation of the 60s, which quite rightly people concentrate on, the abolition of capital punishment and gay rights and so on, uh, the early days of. There were attempts to do all that in the 50s. And uh, it's wrong, however, even just to see the 50s as a kind of warm-up act for the 60s, but they were to a much higher degree. And also the 60s didn't impinge upon our lives. Uh, the myth does, until much later in the 70s. If you grew up in mid-Gloucestershire by the time I left for Cambridge in 1966, it certainly hadn't reached the village of Nimsfield or Franz Lynch. <laughs> I'm not sure that it has yet in some cases. Um, so, and that ridiculous line that everybody quotes, if you can remember the 60s you weren't there, bollocks on stilts that is as well. And I was at Cambridge when it did change, I remember. I came up in 66, betweeded as I am this evening, pipe smoking, like my elder sister's uh, boyfriends who've done national service, quite keen on rowing in a slapdash sort of way. And then in 67, people came up with caftans, smoking things I didn't understand and I still don't get. And I was that strange limbo period. And also, I couldn't stand the 60s, to be honest. I don't know if you bring out this confessional mood in me, because people did talk such bollocks when they were on marijuana. Um, they would take you on one side and give you the secrets of life. You know, dreadful. Dreadful, and I still haven't got over it. I mean, I'm going to have a terrible problem writing that history book of the 60s because I'm so unsympathetic. But you and I have talked about this. You, you, I won't say what Tony's told me, but he had a wonderful encapsulation of the importance of 62, 63. But we'll save that for a future occasion, won't we, Tony? But I'm going to need your help writing the 60s and George's and other people in this room because I'm, um, as you can see, a throwback to a previous generation. Gentlemen in the middle there. In the blue shirt. Oh, sorry. Um, John O'Brien, um, you talked about the jagged line between um, journalism and contemporary history, and I wondered um, what helps you uh, negotiate the line. And 
I suppose I was thinking about it in the context of the chapter in having it so good about Suez. Yeah. And um, when would you or your successor write that chapter about Iraq? Interesting. I think when the Chilcot inquiry comes out, we'll be much closer. Robin's report took us a very, very long way, if Robin will forgive me for saying so, far further than the press ever let on. Um, but again, I don't want, don't want to put him on the spot on that. It was, it was in Kipling's phrase of um, the Boer War, no end of a lesson. But Chilcot will be an even bigger no end of a lesson because it's covering so much more. It's already the size of 12 PhDs, which in the University of London means 12 times 100,000 words. Huge. And I would wager, I'm not a gambling man, I'd wager something on it being hugely critical of the process, the short-circuiting of proper collective cabinet discussion, uh, amongst other things. That'll be up there in Technicolor, as indeed it was in Robin's report too. So I think you'll be able to start writing certain bits of it, certainly the process side of it all. But a remarkable amount of the intelligence has come out already in Robin's report. I mean, never before <coughs> did we have a report saying how many human agents we've had in the country and the reliability of them. Uh, most extraordinary. It, a report like that would have been inconceivable even at the time of the Frank's report on the Falklands because there was a great row, as we know from Laurie Friedman's official history, about whether the, the existence of the Joint Intelligence Committee and its assessment staff should have been admitted in the, in the Frank's report. We've come a long, long way since then. So I think Chilcott is going to be quite remarkable. And I only hope it doesn't... It's, it's about a year's time we can expect it, but I hope it doesn't slip any further. To be honest, I'd hope that they would publish a report next March on the anniversary of the invasion on the road to the operation and then do the next bit, the post-invasion. The post but they've decided to do it all as one. But that will be utterly remarkable. And I'm not one of those people that <clears throat> says it's a waste of time because, for example, in Libya, uh, it was almost as if the Chilcot effect was there. In fact, it was there, because David Cameron took great pains to get a UN Security Council resolution that was specific, and also he published in full the Attorney General's legal advice. So we've already had, um, Robin's report has had that impact, and in anticipation of Chilcot, they did that. And I've heard people say <coughs> in the Labour government that we had to be careful on this or that because we didn't want to be butlered. It became a verb, and it'll be Chilcotted. So that will be um, very, very significant. But it would be huge. I mean, I'm just hoping that they, well, I'm sure they will, because some very good PEMs involved in that, um, do it in such a way that not everybody, not, we don't have to read all million words to get the gist of it, which would be quite tricky. Mr. Chairman of the White Show. You mentioned about the, the danger of using uh, diaries as a source, but I just wondered if you had any good, um, good examples of failures to distill the frenzy. It's very hard for politicians not to inhale their own careers, not to see it as a kind of rolling biography. And they all want a legacy, whether they admit it or not. And it means that Amidst the wreckage, even if it has ended in tears, there's a desperate attempt to plead at the bar of history. And I can understand that, it's very human. And um, the desire to be understood. Uh, the problem is acute too, in particularly acute in those that can't, in the words of the immortal historian Vic Reeves, let it lie after they finish, that want to wander the world like the flying Dutchman doing good. You can imagine who I'm talking about. Um, again, I think the model should be Major Attlee, who, who had a very quiet retirement, would go to um, the odd uh, seminar in Oxford or here and say things like, um, cabinet government depends on discussion, but it only works if you could stop people talking. <laughs> uh, and lead, led a very modest life and wrote a memoir so dull that it was unendurable to read, actually. Not that that's an, as it happened. I think, uh, what's his name, Hollis, Christopher Hollis, wrote a review of that, saying it was written in such a way that things happened to Mr. Attlee. Even. But again, he, he was a man who underestimated himself, I think. Although George has always thought I've raised him too high in the Pantheon, and Roy Jenkins thought that he and I and others had raised Clem Attlee too high in the Pantheon. 
but um, he's still up there with me, um, in my estimation, right at the top. There's the two, the two weather-making premierships of the, my, of my age that I've been writing about. One is Clem and the other is Mrs. Thatcher. They're remarkable weather-makers. There's a kind of version of this in the House of Commons members' lobby. Who gets a statue and who gets a bust? <laughs> and it's 20th century prime ministers. And the great war leaders get statues, Lloyd George and Churchill. And Mrs. Thatcher and Clem Attlee get statues but the rest get busts, which is quite interesting. And you can still see Churchill. They've got a little sign saying, don't touch it, because Conservative MPs going into the chamber would polish with their hands for luck his shoe. Uh, and it's all, it looks like a highly polished shoe, and it was all wearing away. You know? um, but if ever you go to the House of Commons lobby, see how the, Com the House of Commons Arts Committee, I think it is, has made its judgment of who the grade one listed prime ministers are and who the also rans are. It's a cruel world, you know, cruel world. <coughs> Martin Lodge, LSC. Um, you pointed to codification, freedom of information, and these inquiries, which are different to previous ones. So how has the British constitution changed as a result of these? Um, the great John Griffith, whose company I really enjoyed and learned such a lot from here, said to me in the corridor, committee corridor of the House of Commons after Westland. He'd just been in 86. He'd just been in to hear the Defence Select Committee putting various people through the ringer. He said, uh, I've decided after all these years that I've been um, deceiving myself. The British Constitution is what happens. <coughs> and there was a lot of profundity in that because there is a never again impulse, I think, in Whitehall. If you've been into a particular hole, I think Whitehall probably operates unconsciously on the Mark Twain principle that history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Which is why the fund of experience documents are drawn up, as Norman Brooke used to call them when he was cabinet secretary, and why internal histories have been written, uh, and why official histories are written. Um, and it's not Macaulay, things broadening down from precedent to precedent, but a lot of it's that. And if there are lessons from the past to be learned, um, they should be. Um, I think it was Alan Taylor who said, maybe well in a lecture in this room, that history teaches, you know, it teaches you about only how to make new mistakes, really. And there is, there is something in that. But there are, Whitehall's been very good at drawing up funds of experience documents over the years. Sir Edward Bridges, when he was head of the Treasury, for example, ordered the um, bringing together of all the key papers in the run-up to the 49 devaluation, Operation Caliban, it was called. And that's very useful. And of course, the, the skeptics would say all oh, that's carefully doctored, but there's no sign that it was. Um, so the, the internal histories that are written are quite revealing. And the Treasury had a wonderful historical section, but it was um, abandoned in 1976 in that round of post IMF cuts. When you, you can get them at Kew, uh, they would draw up the lessons for the Canby Island floods, for example, as well as past attempts at income policy. And Whitehall, despite the pressures, is still pretty good at that, I think. And I think it's absolutely vital to do that when people can. Man with the shirt. Not a man with the shirt. A blue shirt. A blue shirt. <laughs> uh, Toby Farmer, a vision loving management consultant, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that's fine. Um, my question really was about your idea of successive drafts of history. And um, we seem to go through those pretty quickly these days in an era of instant news. FOI and really rapidly turned around uh, political memoirs. And I wonder what impact, if any, that had on more formalized histories. Well, the more ingredients, the better, but you mustn't inhale any of them. And I think it's true to say, I think Robin and I might have talked this at the Royal College of Defense Studies with the colleagues there, that the first version of the breaking story is rarely the accurate one. And I knew that as a journalist, um, but you had to go with what you've got, just as private offices have to in advising ministers. You have to make sense of it as best you can. But the first version is usually any, in no way, yeah. And of course, the blogosphere means that the conspiracy theorists, who are legion, get their versions in very, very quickly. And um, people are very credulous. We might have given up on organized religion in large numbers in this country. People believe almost anything. 
and the areas of maximum fantasy are the world of British intelligence and the royal family. And there, when they're combined, fantasy takes over. And indeed, the genius of the Olympics opening ceremony was to have the two combined. <laughs> the two most potent brand images of our country abroad. Half the world has seen a Bond movie. A Bond movie. But most of them believe it's actually like that. That's what's so worrying. Chris Andrew, the official historian of MI5, Wonderful man. He has a theory, Andrew's Law, that conspiracy theories double between London and Paris. They double again between Paris and Rome, and they quadruple between Rome and the Middle East. I think there's a lot in that. Of course, the LSE, being a temple of reason, evidence, has never succumbed to that. Question on the edge, there. Um, Professor Hennessy, can I ask you if you have uh, a draft of history of Michael Cockerell and his uh, TV uh, biographies of politicians. I met him once, and he said I was a, a history undergraduate, and graduate, and thought, uh, how marvellous if we to see the uh, views of Gladstone and Israeli on film now today, as we can yes. contemporary politicians. This, and he went on to make a series of films about um, politicians, cabinet ministers, etc. Yes. He said uh, he, that it takes 30 hours of filming to make one hour of a TV programme. And it seems that the off-cuts of his works would be extremely interesting. Oh, yeah. What are your views? Well, I'm a great Michael Cock friend and a fan, and we wrote a book together 30 years ago, Michael and I, with David Walker. Um, so I'm very much pro-Michael. But if, even if I wasn't a friend and we hadn't worked together, I'd be very pro, because he does capture things. Mind you, we'd have been stretched with Mr. Gladstone. The first question would have been answered in about four and a half hours, which would have got through a lot of film and the bulk of Michael's budget. It would have been a nightmare. Disraeli would have been much better. The aphorisms would have tripped off one after the other, the well-rehearsed spontaneity, piling up upon well-rehearsed spontaneity. But Michael, they're wonderful uh, artifacts. He dropped me in it once with Jim Callaghan, who I did like and admire. And... Um, it was about the job of Prime Minister. And he ran this bit. He said, uh, Lord Callaghan, Professor Peter Hennessy says most male Prime Ministers are in love with the Queen to some degree and that you were one of them. I'm in love with my wife, he said. <laughs> it was really quite, produced a certain free song between Jim and me. I did like Jim. He wasn't, he wasn't a natural open government man and he used to get very cross when I leaked the numerals and membership of his cabinet committees. It seems ridiculous now. And in the, in the book, I've got a chapter called Being, On Becoming an Item in the Archive. And it's the leak inquiries into me from that era that have been declassified. And I feel very bad now, because Jim had enough to worry about in the winter of disconsent without this irritating youth on the Times. But the bit that takes the palm for me, and I like Merlin Rees as well, his Home Secretary, who's a lovely man, and I penetrated Gen 29, which was the Cabinet Committee on More Open Government, you see, and wrote it up in the Times. <coughs> and roughly speaking what he was doing and who was on it. And this irritated them beyond belief. And they said, this can't go on. And it was the Cabinet Committee on Open Government. There was not the slightest trace of self-irony about it, actually. But there we are. I, I was an irritating youth, there's no question. And Jim actually, uh, Ken Stowe was a lovely man. I think it was Ken, it might not be. Somebody in number 10 said, we ought to send Hennessy's file to the Director General of MI5. And Jim said, don't do that. We'll just have to put up with his irritating articles as best we can. It, I'm pretty sure, actually, it might not have been Ken Stokes, so I take that back. Somebody suggested it. But how long ago all that seems? And the mere flash of Gen 29 and the pages of the Times could lead to a leak inquiry. We have come a long way since then. But my, going back to Michael Cockrell, wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. One more. one more question. I, I'm going to ask the final question. Okay. Take one more from the floor. So Hi there. Uh, David Flower. I'm a teacher at Dulwich <coughs> College. Um, although I don't teach it, I see there's a, it's either an A-level or GCSE unit on the War, of War on Terror now. Yes. Uh, I wondered if you had a view on where we should teach history up to or what history we should be teaching at school. Well, uh, it's very difficult if there's a, a large intelligence element in it. To get, well, I'm two minds about that. But... My definition of contemporary British history is from the 3rd of September 1939 to this morning's quality newspapers, um, which is a pretty all-embracing version. But when it comes to teaching modules or uh, school or universities, it's, it's quite tricky. You need a good run of primary to go on. It's not enough just to have the newspapers and the, the quick books, although some of them are very good. But I would be a bit uneasy, to be honest, about that. 
my bias is to have a, a good run of primary material somewhere if you can. Well, let, let me just sort of finish off then. We are at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Yeah. This has been a fascinating talk, but is contemporary history as good as political science gets? Um, I don't want to, you're tempting me to be rude <laughs> I about am. people that build <laughs> models. You see, the core executive is complete bollocks on stilts. It's in all the A-level politics textbooks, and everybody I've ever known in the cabinet office doesn't recognize it, but it doesn't seem to put them off. Uh, it is pure balls. It's unrecognisable. But every sixth form student has to pretend it's serious and real, otherwise they won't get the grades. It does worry me. Good friends of mine have developed it. I'm being libelous to my friends now. But it bears no relationship to the reality, as far as I can see. But they would say, what does Peter know? He's a good friend of ours, but he's a storyteller. And they're right. Let's hear it for Max Bygraves. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I, I need to bring tonight's session to a close, so can I... Thank Peter for an ever entertaining and subtly informative talk. It's, it's always a great pleasure to welcome you back to Thank LSE you. to uh, keep us straight, those of us who aspire to a science that is, is more than just humbug. Um, Thank you all of you for coming to this session. I should uh, remind you in closing that there are further British government at LSE events throughout this term and next. Um, we have um, Lord Lawson coming, um, a, a, a speech by um, a lecture by Professor Tim Bale on the current state of the Conservative Party, and we have Michael Heseltine, just to name a few of the uh, highlights of this term. So I hope those of you who've been interested in Peter's conversation, which I think is the high value part of tonight, the insider's view of British politics, British government. Um, those of you who are interested in that, I hope you will be back for more. So join with me in thanking our speaker tonight. <laughs>